Welcome to the BFDG Design Forum, Making Fireworks. I'm Blair Barnett, the British Film Designers Guild Chair. <clears throat> and the Guild was formed over 70 years ago with the aim of raising the standards and profile of the art department and protecting the interest of its members. And those core principles still apply today. We are a fantastic community of over 600 accredited skilled technicians and designers whose talents span the various branches of the art department in film and television. And joining me today is production designer, Jamie Lapsley, who Hi. is the designer from Bodyguard, Tommy's Honor, Kill Command, lots of other great stuff. And she's going to talk about the great work that she and her art director, Felix Coles, did, uh, uh, who also uh, worked on Boys Don't Cry and The Host, so a couple of two talented gals, um, and their job on the short film Fireworks. Over to you, Jamie. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm just going to go to share screen and share the uh, presentation, let's call it, um, to take you all through. So some background to this i um it's a short film shot using virtual production it's one of the first things that's shot in the uk um and i got involved because i'd been previously working with um, chris cox at mbs doing some live visuals um for a gig at the roundhouse um which got cancelled because of covid and then chris invited me along to a showcase at, um in Didka of Unreal and, and, and projection walls. And I spent a few days with him and met everyone coming in who was looking at the tech. So, you know, we had, you know, Greg Fraser had flown over because he was doing the Batman and he was showing Matt Reeves stuff and all of this. And on the back of that, I got kind of in just like spamming Instagram with it going, oh my God, this is amazing. Um, an old colleague of mine, a producer reached out and said, we're doing something with Double Negative, with Neg, with Paul Franklin, who's the director who has a few Oscars in his uh, library yeah. <laughs> from the work he did with Chris Nolan on Batman and stuff. So will you be interested? And I was like, well, yeah, great. It's like the goddamn pandemic has just finished. Just going back into those first commercials in that September 2020. And so this script came along and I'm going to play the trailer and then I'm going to talk you through what it is. So you just have a look at this. This is this is the trailer before, for the finished thing. Before, Sorry, you, before you play the trailer, will you just kind of explain a teeny bit about what the virtual production is? So the virtual production, we we essentially did the uh, the bells and whistles version of shooting on an LED volume. So we had an LED wall, which we used to represent um, elements outside the physical set. And I'll show you the trailer and I'll talk about the project and how we developed it and how I understood to use virtual production. And it's something I've used since and something I've been working with screen skills and various people in terms of education for art department and productions so they understand what it is and how like the pyramid goes back to art department every time so, <laughs> um... on time on time is lit we have a vehicle approaching the target's residence you have to launch. Wave it off. Belay that order. This is my ops room. I give the gore otherwise. All right. Bravo one at minimum safe. Please lie. Um, so that was put together. It was, um, Stephen Lally was the writer, and he put together this script basically about the the day-to-day -day life of a bunch of um, technicians and office workers at MI5 and the kind of work they do in ending other people's lives around the world and, and the kind of way that was politicized within an office and becomes like a, it's like, it is like the office, except there's, there's very real consequences. Yes. <laughs> and conceptually, it was all originally before virtual production came along before the LED volume, it was just gonna take place in a physical set and there was gonna be stuff seen on screens. And then there was a version of it they were gonna do in the augmented reality where you'd wear a headset and you'd see motion captured volumetric people in, and it was like a site installation piece. But it turned into a piece of virtual production and we were looking at it and my pitch to them in terms of how to do it, cause they were saying, oh, it'd be great if we could like snapshot through a wall at a certain point and see what's going on outside and look at this location and look at this location. And my pitch was that, why don't we just treat it like we're making the film in 1981, 
And as if we'd gone to Tripoli or, you know, the, the it stand in Malta or wherever we are, and we build the control room on location and slowly but surely, as the peace takes place and the tension rises, we take walls away and we reveal we're in this environment. This is a, an image I found. This is someone's holiday photos from kicking around in Libya, like way before sort of 2001, before the kind of war on terror, um, inverted commas. Um, and so this was, when we're looking at the script, it's scripted at a crossroads and various things. And I saw this image and I was like, this is fantastic. This is like a proper proscenium view of this world outside of it. So I did a couple of sketches to kind of outline that concept how we were going to do this like how we were going to treat the project so basically if you see on the left hand side that pink element is the control room element and then the city around it so my pitch was I will design everything within this sketch and then we'll do a matte painting for the background and we will choose which elements we build because at one point we weren't even going to build the room we were just going to put our props and technology in the foreground and then do the walls virtually but actually, as we progressed and we started to see the limitations of the digital system, of the digital, the wall, the light levels and the complexity of finding the right shooting space to stand a wall in, the pitch then became, OK, as per the right hand image, we build a physical set and the virtual screen goes outside and that represents the world. So the design challenge was to design an intersection from that one image on on um, the pitch. So if we look look at the next board, this is the first storyboard I did for them to say, here's the, here's the concept. We start off top left and the first wall disappears and the second lot of walls on, and the end frame, which actually in hindsight, we never achieved on the physical shoot because of the complications of striking things and the aesthetic look they were going for, was that what you would then see would be the technicians standing in the bomb site they're right in it of, yeah of, of of the of the attack afterwards and and so this was the opening gambit those two images i was like my understanding of what this technology is capable of is let's do that let's go as far as we can let's push everything past its limit let's break ourselves trying to make it seamless let's not be clever about hiding edges and if you watch anything like the mandalorian or any of the other projects that weren't unreal there's lots of times where there's there's a berm coming up and there's things happening and there's foreground to separate from the screen. And, but we were inspired by the first image that came out of the Mandalorian where the ground plane went on to infinity. So I was like, let's just break ourselves and try and do this, which my friend Felix, who hasn't been able to join the call, but she's on, I think she's on the seminar. Um, it was her team who had the responsibility on the physical set of like with fine brushes, like getting this scene. But we'll come to that. So I treated this the way I would treat anything. And I tend to use SketchUp when I'm blocking out ideas. You know, for me, the flexibility of that system is it's a, it's a design tool that can become a production tool afterwards. Like it can become digital drawings. It can become construction drawings, but I can use it to just block out shapes and play with Lego. So taking that original image, started knocking in this geometry to represent what I understood I was looking at. And again, just using block forms, some projection mapping modeling, and just building it up again in SketchUp to come to this image, which was like, this is our key view. This image was the key image and from my point of view, like, okay, here's where we're going. And this is just rendered out of SketchUp in um, Indigo renderer. So off the shelf freebie kind of render, there's nothing clever. Um, and then just playing with some lens refractions, trying to get everyone on board. And then this is where we started to look at the overall concept of how the design works. Like this was the control room set and this was the city beyond this. So at this point, there's a digital studio who are going to do the, the modeling of the set, of the digital sets. And one thing that they describe themselves as, and all of the teams who do this describe themselves as, is a virtual art department. And that's an incredibly misleading misnomer because they are, digital um sorry virtual set construction and virtual set decoration and virtual uh gaffers basically they they become a whole subsection of once the once the once the design is delivered up until the shooting but what they're not doing is they're not working they're not delivering the work the way that an art department was so they were working from concepts 
as they saw them and iterating to generate ideas, which we'll come to shortly. But my process as a production designer is I'm delivering construction drawings for these sets, which is what I got to. Well, once I understood that their capability as digital artists, they have no, you know, didn't have architectural backgrounds. They were very games orientated and it was very quick, but everything was based on, oh, does that look okay for the shot? And my discipline in making it, um, treat it as though we were building it for real. So every doorway got drawn, every window got drawn and it enabled the modelers to go through. So then I started researching that environment and Tripoli in Libya is quite complicated because there's no map of it. There's like really, really fast um, imagery on Google Earth because of it's a it's a you know, holiday photos, more holiday photos and videos of these environments. So I started to really work out how it was and using kind of camera projection in SketchUp, started to build true geometry of all of these pieces, work our way through looking at ideas for which doorways we liked and these repetition of shape, repetition of color, and the patina and the breakdown and the cables on the building. So for me, this was building the recipe that I would then in theory, if we were making this physically, hand off to my art directors to develop up. Like I just, you know, my, my own design practice is I do a metric ton of research and nail everything and then hand it off to the guys to just go ahead and deliver. So I'm sure, so these are the aerial views that were available and the, you know, one drone shot. So kind of piecing this together, building the design as it went along. So started to reach a more kind of detailed SketchUp model. And one thing that we've since learned is you can import SketchUp's using a, uh, uh, an, a, a plugin called Datasmith directly into Unreal Engine and you can look at them. But what I was doing was using my iPad as a virtual AR camera package so we could recce the set at the same time as the digital team were doing on their side with their, their version of the environment. And here's their first pass at the environment. And it's that broad strokes things where it kind of looks a bit like what I'd done and a bit like what the reference was, but it had been mitigated and produced again be, below, you know, it was this weird dynamic where I would hand over the artwork and then there would be a producer on the digital side who would manage the workflows of all the artists and make decisions about what was appropriate to leave in the same way that an art director would, but I was being treated like I was an outside client. And there was lots of conversations about, oh, it's really difficult. We have to model this in 3D Studio Max and we've got people using Rhino. And it was one of those moments from my side where I was like, I was using Rhino art school in 1995. Like I, I used to Yes, my degree program in 99 our old hat and in an art department we use all of this like yeah. we do 3d previs as a matter of our development of our ideas of our sets it's not new tech but the, a lot of the participants who are coming into the industry to do virtual come from post-production and their kind of instinct is they're the ones who did, do digital environments and we're going to educate art department. And every project I've been involved in, I've had to do like an educational program with the, the digital set modelers to show them what we're capable of. And quite often that's helped enormously with the process because from design side, I want to hand over a finished design that can go left to construction or go right to digital construction. And the deliverables, as far as my art directors, my drafts people are concerned, uh, there's no difference. They just need a digital file they can work from. And yeah. so getting the, um, the digital team up to speed with this process. So this was kind of thing where it was like, okay, these are aesthetics, but none of the architecture was correct for the environment. These were all generic Mideastern building blocks. And my pitch to everybody was like, this has to look exactly like Libya. It has to look exactly, that's why we've chosen this location because this is what we do in design is we make it's a choice not generic. And, we, yeah. you're making, and then we you're you know and we, we embellish the, the yeah okay so i started then sketching over their modeling and using photoshop to put planes of reference from photos and numbering all the buildings and then i realized that i need to give them a discrete model and construction drawings for every single building on the set <laughs> Luckily, because I'd been kind of cooling my jets during a pandemic, I just spent ages building the models in SketchUp and 
and they're all repeated forms and all the doorways are the same so it became its own lego kit mm -hmm. you can see here where it starts to get into the construction drawings and then playing with textures going into programs like blender to do photoreal texturing and again this was me kind of throwing my weight around with the digital team a little bit and saying like I'm not a modeler I'm not but I can get this to a point where you don't have you should not as a as, as a um as a building team there shouldn't be any questions about what's happening in the same way that I wouldn't expect questions be from my my scenic artists if I give them the right reference and I tell them what I'm after and I show them an illustration or a photo or a photoshop or whatever then that's the information you work from and I'll come and I'll I'll, I'll sit with you and I'll look at it and we'll maybe play with it a little light, lighter or darker but I'm not interested in in seeing imagery that's like a thousand miles away from what the reference is so it's a very different workflow for them because they were used to getting artwork and then they would do internal concepts i actually had one day where they'd spent three days they, they were like oh we'll have a meeting on thursday it was monday morning and i was like no we need to talk now i said oh no we're going to do some work <laughs> and what they did do is they got three concept artists to do three days worth of iterations of the covered area of this set and like, you don't need to do any concept work like the drawing's done like that's what it looks like i wouldn't have given it to you if i was vague because again, me and Paul, you know, he's storied as a filmmaker and I've been around for long enough that I know what I'm asking for. Like I'm not, I'm not finding my way in the dark here. So again, getting into more explicit references and showing them these images where it's like, here's the photo, here's the photo modeling, here's the elevation, here's all the details, picking out the things, giving them really explicit guidance so that they understood that they were also the set deck department. And they had to prop it. They had to prop the set. And they also had to dress the set as if they were a props team. So they had to put storytelling into their props. And so if they did a, if they did a stall and there was a guy in the background, they had to make a choice about what he was selling and what else was going on. So there was a couple where you'd have, let's say, these, uh, uh, you know, mannequins and, and kind of hats and stuff. And then there'd be fruit in front of it. And it was like, no, that doesn't work. Or there'd be a wheelbarrow sitting somewhere randomly in space. And this is one of the one of the most kind of enlightening examples was they'd used it because they felt a bit of the foreground looked quite dead. And I was like, well, OK, that's like an aesthetic choice and we'll, that's fine. But we'll do that with, with the director on the day. But I asked them in the meeting, who's uh, whose wheelbarrow is it? And they looked at me like I was insane. And I was like, well, if I said to one of my props team, can you put a wheelbarrow on the set? They would then come up with a narrative as whose wheelbarrow that was. They put things in it. They put a water bottle in it or a satchel or they tie a high-vis jacket around it or there'd be a shovel and some cement and there'd be something and there'd be some evidence of who the person was. And that was one thing that they hadn't understood is that one thing we do in design is we apply story mm. to everything you see. You, you, you just layer and layer and layer. So again, more kind of architectural research, finding a building type, and then finding other photos of the same building or the same building type within that city and Getty and places like this were great. And, and because we're doing it digitally, you know, the, I just worked from the preview images. I'm not spending anyone's money on that. Um, shock horror. So again, like building, building um, models, doing the elevations, doing detail work. Uh, this is the market that we found. And again, this center image here is like from a holiday video. And it was such a great resource because it was like what I was looking like, these twisted flutes. And what happened is I'd been getting concepts of what the columns look like. And I was like, not understanding the focus here. This isn't a computer game where we're going to walk through this. this is a background image. So deliver what's in the image. Like I want to manage your workflow. Let's deliver what's in the image. So go through more elevations. And so we get to sort of this world here, which is my kind of final sketch layout. So I kept working on my side to give them geometry so I could send them FBX files, which would have the real world sizing of everything in it. And that was one thing they hadn't got quite used to was everything has to be built to specification. So, so this is where we got to. This is like the final layout of the foreground of the set with all the digital modeling. And the next slide is 
how that got developed in Unreal. So I think what everyone finally understood was that they're matching pretty much exactly based on, we moved doors and stuff like that, but all of the, like the lighting direction ideas and stuff like that, what they hadn't quite understood was that's what we do in production design. We deliver that yeah. for them. They thought they were coming in to invent a design process with Paul and they would iterate through it and, and granularly work their way towards a solution. Whereas the big reveal was I'm the production designer on this um, and we're going to work through this. So a, a disclaimer to say is none of this was negative. This was all just us all learning process. This is all us working our way through and kind of breaking down our own expectations. But the process was, was very difficult for us to understand what the limitations were and how we, how we work our way through it and how we break down the barriers of each of our design processes. And it was interesting because there was, and there is still a conversation about, do we need to change art department practice to facilitate the digital um, set modeling more? And I hate to say it, but the answer is no, oh. because, um, what we do as storytellers and as designers is a holistic design process. The delivery of the detail imagery afterwards will want to change. But as we go along, um, we need to do our process because the point is you make a choice about whether or not you're building something physically or digitally, but you have to design it, you know? So in terms of the way that the files are handed over, so there's certain, um, let's say, disciplines like rhino has become quite ascendant as a tool in the sense that that's quite good for doing construction and, and set modeling and it ports completely seamlessly with um unreal engine to kind of texture models so we go through so if we move on to the interior physical set so this was the classic set build again initially we weren't sure if it's going to be digital or not um but when we realized actually let's just build a set so I did all these sketches and Felix who's my art director she was responsible for the fit up and install and managing of the whole shoot because I was on another project so I commissioned the 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 um the build and did all this artwork and work with the director again just sort of you know one woman art department for a little while trying to pull this together and, you know, playing with my Ken Adam light shafts on the top right, but clearly not as effective. Um, working our way through and again, starting to work in SketchUp, look at this, playing through it, looking at textures, looking at detail, working our way through. And this is where I started to do, here's what the final shot. So this is essentially very rudimentary previs in art department. So here's what we imagine the shots would look like on camera lenses using just a very basic camera tools in, in, in SketchUp where you can, you can't do anamorphics, but you can put, so you can set a, you know, what your sensor size is, whether it's an uh, Alexa or a Sony Venice or whatever, um, and choose your lenses. So from that, developing the digital construction drawings, handing those over and having the set built in studio. Um, hilariously, we built the set in Glasgow and then trucked it to um, uh, London for the absolute lols. Um, my construction team in Glasgow, um, it's a firm called Pretty Scenic, who are wondrous and have done many jobs. Construction teams becoming kind of UK wide because when it's busy and you're struggling to get someone to build something, the cost of an articulated lorry is neg negligible compared to. Um, so we kind of tried to get this built in London and the numbers didn't work. And I'd had some flattage from a project that was going unused with this construction team. So we designed it based on the stock flattage and just skinned it with new sheets of MDF. But they did a beautiful job. So this came down. And then this is us looking at the whole project in um, Unreal Engine and starting to look at how we kind of spot and do the set dressing. So this is one of the, this is the moment when you start to see all the fruits of your labor and all the detail is because you then start lighting the set and dressing the set virtually before you hit the set. So all of these processes can become quite collaborative and the DP can become involved. And we start to play with the physical origin of the, of the virtual world. So on this image here, we choose where, you can see where the crosshair is in the middle. That's essentially a marker for where the physical set would sit if we were on location. So you start to play with all of this. 
and then you start to get into the digital um, grading, which you need to sort of do before you shoot, which is Unreal Engine is great, but it doesn't do everything and it doesn't work exactly like reality. So there's lots of benefits from it, but there's lots of things you need to do in terms of the way it generates shadows and the intensity of shadows. And you can't quite see it on this because there's a green line by the car, but that car is generating a consistently toned shadow across the ground plane at all points. Yet its cast shadow would be darker in the center where there's less bounced light from the ground next to it. So it's things like this, and you start to get into this. And it was amazing having Paul as our director because he's, you know, he's an Oscar winning VFX soup. So he sees at that level whether or not something's working. So you can see here, and, and, and you start to play with it, and you start to see things that you can do, but you also start to realize that you need to control the complexity of the image because the system, whichever system you're working with, only has certain limits, and you, and you hit against them pretty quickly. And what we had with Dimension was an amazing team um, led by a chap called Craig Stiff um, and Ed Thomas, and they would essentially triage the set and delete geometry that was never going to get seen and come in and get rid of stuff, which allowed the computers to run it in real time. So one part of the design process is you build this world, you build it to your specification, but then you need wizards to come in. And this is where it is someone else's game. And you're like, and what they did in making it look like we'd signed off, but run on the wall was astonishing. The things that were happening in the, even to the point where Craig was, scanning our foreground set and using that as a texture on the digital set, which I'll show you shortly. So here's like the grayscale of the physical set. So that's quite a geometry heavy environment. And all of these vehicles are moving and all these people are moving. So all the, all the actors, the virtual actors in this are mocap library stock of people walking. Dimension have an XR suite so they can do full body, um, like volumetric scanning of people in motion and deliver that as, as volumetric animation. So we had all this, so that was the thing as well. We started to work out how close do we make the people to the wall so that how much detail do we need to have on them? And we kind of had layers of people and you turn people on or off and it would affect the playability of the game engine, essentially. It's the frame rate of it, essentially. If you think about playing on your Xbox or your PlayStation. If the imagery in the environment gets really heavy, you can start, well, traditionally you would get stutter and your frame rate would drop, which is a bit massive thing in PC world, but it's exactly the same on Unreal. And you have to manage the complexity of the foreground versus that going on. So here's kind of where we got to in terms of the way the world was looking on the screen. This is sort of near enough our final asset. And there was still some details and like highlights and speculality on the truck in the foreground, it doesn't quite read as, as capturing the light. It's not blooming, like the highlights aren't blowing out like they would if it was really there and it was a metal surface. So there's always things to work on. And this image shows the red line. And this is essentially what you do is you, you, you decide where you build the wall. And if I just quickly scan back to the first image and just hopefully you guys can see this, is what we were doing is we were just choosing in our space where the wall sits. And this is one of the things to think about with virtual production is that in design, you're designing everything. You're designing as far as the eye can see. And then what you're doing after the fact is choosing where the wall goes. You're just, that's, that's the big choice. And so you, just, you basically choose where the wall sits in the three space. Um, and then in theory, everything, foreground of that red line is physical set and fortunately for us it was single ground plane and here's the single ground plane the image on the bottom left and that's Felix's team uh, on their hands and knees like grading the colors of the ground plane to make it fade so that we could match the highlights and the shadow because what we found we had too much contrast in the ground plane and the screen couldn't deliver it the screen resolution and the brightness and the, and the shadow detail couldn't give us it so we were kind of dusting over the ground plane to kind of you can see it sort of top right it gets it fades out as it gets closer to the screen 
and it was fascinating, but what the team did at Dimension is they scanned the ground plane and then put that into the digital plane. And that's one thing we used on the Nancy as well is we built a lot of our foregrounds on that. It was a fantastical world and you guys won't see it until like next year probably. Um, but we built all of our environments because it was a, a mythical landscape and all of our rock plates and our, and our ground planes. Then we had them all scanned and they became the dressing elements in the digital space. So what we managed on that show on some of the really successful environments, which I will talk about when it's done, is where I can't remember where the ground plane is on the, on the virtual shots. And it's one of the things I've pushed for consistently is the ambition of the audience buys it if they don't see some foreground pop up, if it just carries on. And most of our shows, you can do a bit of post to help with the blend line, but it was... So here's an, here's an image. And the ground plane here extends basically all the way to here and once I've drawn it you can see it and you're like oh okay but it plays beautifully mm, it certainly does this is the kind of filming process on the right hand side you can see what the digital team are looking at the whole time which is the physical set which got scanned and then the digital environment and then where the wall position is and which screen is showing them and that's Paul with a big stick in the foreground. And what he would be doing is pointing at the screen and looking at elements that needed to be altered or developed. Here's the wide. You can see the line of the screen here. This is actually before it had been filtered on. So this was the, the key concept is that the, the set in the foreground behaves like it's sat in the environment. And whether it's successful or not is its own conversation in the final cut and grade. But one thing we did do is we digitally faded the wall in real time. So we scanned our set, our physical set, once it was built and the shot on the top left. And then we put that scanned set wall into the digital environment and faded it out in real time. So that visual effect happened in camera, which was one of the things we didn't imagine we could do. And it's one of the things that led to one of the larger conversations I had with Dimension and with Paul and with, and with a few other filmmakers since in terms of rather than just using the technology as a digital translite, which is essentially what it is, it's a full motion translite, is there's opportunities in the storytelling here about moving people between spaces and doing real time visual effects and playing with space and time. And they're, and they're akin to the kind of games you'd play in live theater and environmental installation art, where you can play with an audience's experience in real time, play with performance. And it, I don't think I've seen anyone unlock that yet, but as a concept, as a, as a tool for filmmakers and storytellers to think about it. I mean, even a simple thing like generating this content means you can be multi-platform with how you deliver the work. So you can deliver it as screen media. You could also deliver this as now, with volumetric capture, you could deliver this as an interactive environment that you stick a headset on and you go to. Or this could be an experiential environment that happens um, in, uh, you know, for audiences and they become the, become the technicians and the walls of the set are on an LED volume around. And there's so many opportunities to kind of take this forward. Um, yeah, and a couple of shots of the of the end thing. So that's kind of the end of, of, of the presentation and my um, rants. So yeah, so so for us, it was like a proper trial by fire because again, the expectation of what each stage of the design process were capable of. And I think what I got out of it was an understanding that it's exactly the same as physical production. You have to treat it. You have to design it. You have to make sure that all the choices are made so that what you're not getting into is a post-production mindset where you are iterating individual components in a kind of uh, trying to please the director scenario. Yeah. Because the only reason we turn over as a, as a production, as an industry, is that we make a lot of choices beforehand and the art department takes the responsibility of making those choices, liaising with the director and making the correct choices so that it's all delivered. And then what you're doing on the day is you're like, well, maybe move the car to the left or maybe we'll move the lights. But what you're not doing, which is probably something people don't realize is you're not moving buildings on the day. Mm. You're not changing 
the animations of characters in the background. That way you, you just won't turn over because the technology isn't, doesn't behave like that. You have to set these systems up. You have to get them optimized. You have to run them. So all of those limitations are there. You know, when you see people playing and they're experimenting where the light's coming from and, and, and you see lots of, uh, and it might change, it might improve the system, but the reality is you need to do as much, if not more planning for virtual than you do for physical. Like if we were shooting this on blue screen or green screen, there's no way I'd have gone into the detail I was doing in the, in, in the environment. But actually what it's taught me is that's a thing to do, even if you are going to shoot on blue screen, is take ownership as a design department. Um, I mean, so much show in, in the midst or on a hiatus from a, a, a contemporary show at the moment, and that has post-production, but I'm on payroll for a month into post to supervise all the initial math art and set extension work that's going on, which has come from being vocal about it and talking to my producers in those first conversations. They've said, well, we've booked you in. And I, and you know, my pitch is I don't need to know anything about visual effects. I'm a massive nerd, so I do, <laughs> but I don't need to know anything about that, but I'm a designer and I make story choices and that voice needs to carry on into post. So, so yeah, I mean, has anyone, have we got any questions? Have I? Um, there been... seem to be a few questions that have come through. Um, I, I see the people have raised their hands, but I don't see their actual questions. Okay, there's there's one um, in the Q&A. Okay, Q so, now we're from Elria. Okay, so there's one open question in the Q&A. So there's a, there's, there's a webinar chat, which is us. What time is it now? I've raced ahead, haven't I? Um, About 20 minutes. asking, how long was prep time? It sounds eternal. <sighs> um, it, well, yeah, I mean, it was. It was It was done while I was on other projects. So it's very peculiar. You know, it was like, but I would say the design of the set, and this is what it comes back to, is my process was the same as it always was. Because I understood that I could just dig in and make the choices and make the decisions and design it. What took longer and actually took probably the same amount of time as building foreground or miniature flattage was the digital set building. That's, that's again, where I don't think people quite understand what it is because making the, the environment work from the design side, you know, from my side, choosing locations and working in SketchUp and generating elevations and doing it's the same design process and this was one environment and yes it was a great fun to investigate and dig into a city so I spent a lot of time researching admittedly probably two weeks really researching to find all these references because I didn't want to go and start inventing stuff because it's meant to be the world as it exists you know it's like again if we were shooting this in 81 we'd go back and film it on location but my design process was the normal. So I was maybe like a week and a half, two weeks to do all of my work and, and lock everything down. But then what took an inordinate amount of time because the tool set was being developed. You know, it was the first project in um, Unreal Engine for Dimension. It was the first project. d -Neg had done some stuff pitching on 1899, but they got involved. And it was kind of the opening gambit for everybody. So what we were doing, which is why kind of the first half of this conversation is me going, oh my God, is because we didn't know. And there were lots of dead ends gone down where pre-existing workflows were followed that were based on client-based work in terms of a commercial where you're showing things to people who don't know what they want. But what the team at Dimension found and really understood and I'm incredibly supported by the end were they were working with two people myself and Paul who knew exactly what we wanted there was no question about what was required from from the design department so okay any other questions I have a question actually um <clears throat> just thinking about like the point of perspective and where you where the camera was going to be shooting through how much of the set shooting through what kind of angle um I mean that kind of hurts my brain thinking about it now so before you had your space and knew what you were going to build physically how much how did you wrap your head around being able to figure out where your horizon lines and everything landed within your set within the virtual build? Well, again, I just treated it like it was a real set, like it was a real location. 
um, and a real design, a real build. So from my point of view, I was I, I was designing everything at once. Do you know what I mean? I wasn't designing a set, which was a physical set, and then designing a background and trying to work out the background. I designed everything. And then we just made a choice again where the screen sat on that plane. And that moved between meetings and weeks. And it would be foreground and it would be background. And I think, again, that's I did a, a course with um, um, Explore and, and Screen Skills. And we've done some, some stuff. And we gave a little exercise to some students where there was a ground plan of a volume. And the description was, you're on the deck of a ship and you're traveling through the Arctic. Come up with a way that you would maybe use the volume and what everybody did was they drew what the physical set was within the space of the volume but the page was quite big and the volume screen was in the middle and at the end of the conversation i sort of pointed out to everybody it's like you need to design everything in every direction and then you're choosing where the wall sits you're choosing that so it's that kind of head scratching didn't come into it because i was like well you step out of the physical set and you're on location. So I just need to design the location. I didn't, I didn't think about any of the technical deliverables. I just said, I'm designing this entire intersection. I will just do that. And then the technology will pick up the slack in terms of the camera and, and how we shoot it. So, Because I think if you try and think of it, if you try and be clever about how you're using it in that sense, you'll wrap yourselves in knots and, and miss stuff. So. Yeah, I can imagine. Oh, here we go. Nice questions. Okay, so this is from Megan. How do you start the receptive conversation with digital team modelers who are used to a client-based workflow? Um, I think I got really cross. I think is how that happened. <laughs> um, but that was the thing. It's because what happened was I was I I'd say I want this, 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 and then it was this setup which is based on the industry that everyone's working in is like well we'll go and work on this and you can review it next week and I was kind of just like hold on that's not how this works like I'm you know I fully expect to be able to come and look at the progress every single day or virtually every single day and see where we are because I know what I want to achieve and I know where to spot the errors so Ra and what again it there was, a, there, was an, there was an expectation that everything needed to be taken to a certain point of presentation, which goes back to one of my biggest bugbears industry-wide is, and it might need to be a certain situation, is anyone who's working in the art department, like, I don't mind what stage you're at or how things look or graphics or whatever, or mock-up. I understand the end point. I understand where this is going to go. So I don't need to be, have it sugar-coated and made to look pretty because I'm not the director. I'm not a financier. So what was happening was stuff was being developed to a level where they thought it looked beautiful and cool, but they'd done four days of work on the wrong thing because they'd not shown me the earlier version. So my thing to them was like, you need, I need a screenshot. Everyone who's working on the, on the, on the modeling team, I need them to screenshot everything they're working on at the close of play. And I need an email dump from you guys at 5 p.m. and I'll look at it before eight the next morning. And if there's any notes, I'll send you notes and sketch over them. And they that blew their minds. They were not used to that level of granular kind of supervision. But again, that's what art department is. That's what designers are. I mean, I, you know, I'm looking at my art director's work. I'm looking at my draft people work. I'm going to set. I'm looking at the painters. I'm talking to everybody every day, and I'm bouncing the parameters of deliverables based on time and resources. And I'm sacrificing some of my darlings as I go because I know that they're not important. But this had gone from that client side thing where it was like, we need to manage my expectations. And I was like, no, I'm the production designer. You need to deliver what I ask you to deliver or you need to be clear as to why you can't. And I will pivot and to give you a brief that you can deliver because that's also my responsibility. I'm not a monster. I'm not here to demand stuff. So. Um, someone says, Kate says, thank you very much. <laughs> My um, was the studio predetermined in a certain range of where the wall would sit? And did you design and choose the space? So the, 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 the actual finish of the environment was something of a total lottery. And we ended up in a space which Felix would have been able to speak to, which was the screen was too close to the set and the screen was too small. 
Um, and that was literally just how the dice shook out at that point because of in-kind funding and where the screen detail come from. And, you know, it's very, lots of compromises were made, which is essentially why in the finished frames, you see a lot of out of focus shots because the camera was too close to the wall. So it's not that the actors are too close to the wall, it's, the, it's when the camera gets too close to the wall and it starts to be able to resolve pixel depth. Um, so that was one of our, you know, total head scratches because if we were on a bigger wall and the camera was further away, it would have played much better. Um, but that's what you learn. I mean, that's the whole point of this is, you know, this was a short film, this was a, a development piece, um, it was technology. So Vanessa's asking, do you think it costs less to build from real or digital? Which method takes more time? Um, I think that's a completely open-ended open question because the work is the work. It's, you know, the reason to do, like, you know, we were a short film and we couldn't have built a set this big. We, we couldn't have afforded the space. So that's what it comes down to. It's, have you got a studio? Where is your camera? So for us, because of the, the contained point of view, this was perfect in terms of building what's outside of it. Um, in terms of which method takes more time, the design process is the same, is the same, but building the assets, I would say takes you as long to build the assets as it takes to build a set. Um, it's about economy, it's about, and the economy isn't, it's not that it's directly um, a, a monetary thing, it's time and space thing. It's the ability to get people to the right places, it's the ability to get materials to the right place. The one thing that does cost a fortune on these things is the wall, but what you get from this, you know, for us to, to replicate triply an environment like that for a short like this, there's no way we'd do it. Yeah. You know, it was a very well-funded short because of the in-kind support. Um, but there's no way you, you'd even, even envisage doing that. And there were lots of tools on the kind of Quixel marketplace where you can download, you know, environments and textures and buildings and stuff. And I would say there's a, there's a, there's a world in where that kind of changes the economics so that you're not particularly building a set. But... I would, I mean, I suppose our thing was everything was built, like every single component, there was no market, but the vehicles were marketplace and the, you know, the props and the things like that were all marketplace elements. Um, but we had to build a lot of fresh geometry for it. And I think that's where it comes down to, um, that's where the money gets spent, is building things fresh. If you can work with pre-existing scanned elements and and real objects. Interesting anecdote, 1899, um, the designer on that, who both Blair and I met over in um, Greece, um, their virtual production side of that, they built one-to-one -one replicas or, or um, examples of every single piece of scenery and texture on that show. So if there was a wall panel in the, um, in the, in the, in the ballroom, they built a full-size one-to-one wall panel with a full-size column piece and a full-size door. And they painted everything as if they were going to shoot on it. And they handed that off to the digital team and said, that's what it looks like. <laughs> so that you basically, again, taking away that subjective view of, oh, does that look good? It's like, no, this is what it is. So the digital team on 1899 changed the way that they textured their digital sets to match the process that physical painters would do. So they layered up their digital sets with different layers of paint and lacquers to get the finish rather than try and do a digital solution and approximate it they realize that you're doing physically based lighting so you should do physically based modeling um how many in the art department team drew up details only in the physical set and help them virtual um it was me i was there. <laughs> there was no art department well, there obviously was an art department felix ran the shoot and the installation but i drew everything i mean that was it it was like a one woman band so you know, that's my kind of own madness was to just get on with it. Um, based on fireworks or Nancy, you think short speeches will start to go um, in this direction more and more? If show how it does in the art department, they're prepped for this change. Um, 
I don't know if it will go more and more because it isn't, it's not magic. It's not easy. It's a really complicated, time-consuming process. But what in art department you need to do is you need to be prepared to take ownership of everything that's beyond the wall. That's mm. the change. Is that if you've got a landscape environment on a Nancy Boys, we made maquettes of our physical mountains. We did little poly, little miniature models in the office, little clay models and little polycarb models, which we scanned and handed off as the base geometry to the digital team to work from because that was the most effective way for me to control the aesthetic. You know, drawing mountains will drive you around the twist. And it's, you know, like if you're making a cave set um, physically, you'll make a maquette, you'll take slices from it, you'll draw profiles. And what we did, we did exactly the same thing for the digital, except we didn't give them profiles. We gave them PowerPoint data from literally an iPhone from photogrammetry um, and scaled it. So I think you, knowing what the tools are, like you don't specifically need to know how to use Unreal Engine. There are people who do that all day, every day, and they are wizards at it. But you need to know how to get your content into Unreal Engine. Yeah. So you need to have an appreciation. Um, from experience, where did the virtual art department help the most? Again, there's no such thing as virtual art department. Um, <laughs> that doesn't exist. It's virtual set construction. Um, they they fulfilled the, the, the space in the project um, that, again, a construction team would do and the scenic team and the set dressers and the greens team and then the gaffers and the, and the sparks. That is what they delivered. So I think, you know, using... So virtual production is one thing and virtual production actually, I would advocate, doesn't have to include shooting on a wall. There were enough tools. Like if you, if you, if, if someone in your department knows how to use Unreal Engine, it's very effective for putting your mock-ups of your sets in and playing with lighting and working with your DP as a live art department focused previous tool, because it can accept geometry from all your programs. You can generate models out of vector works and port them in. You can, you know, you can get someone to, again, I've, done it with SketchUp models, which aren't the most advanced and they've really sharp edges and you can't do clever stuff with them, but you can import that straight into Unreal and you can look at lighting models within that, which then means you can then do multi-user headset sessions so you can scout virtually, which James Chinland will undoubtedly talk about when he does his Batman one, you know, with Matt Reeves. Um, but I think that's it. I think it's, I think to all of you, I would, I would just say, um, don't use the term virtual art department. <laughs> virtual set. They are they're, they're virtual set builders. Thank you, Jane Woods. <laughs> That's very nice. Um, but yeah, it's it's full on. That's amazing. I mean, I am every time you talk, I can hear you talk. I, I'm just sitting here going, yeah. <laughs> wow. No. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. I can't contribute to anything more because I just find what you do is utterly fascinating. And also there's the whole aspect of the fact that you didn't have to go to Tripoli. You didn't have to go to a place and waste so a that, lot of So that's the revelation. It's that was the revelation. It's more, it's yeah. achievable in that way. It's really you know, helpful go, in that way. So to go back to that question about what was the benefits, the benefits of this system meant that I myself could design an entire city. Think about that, everyone. Design an entire city. And I just sat and did it using the tools I use every day. I use SketchUp. And I've, I mean, it's hilarious. I've been using SketchUp since like 2005. Um, it's good. And I, I remember in 2013 using my original generation iPad, taking a director to, um, where was it? It's the Vinyl Factory in Hayes with a virtual representation of the post-production, not the physical set, but the post-production buildings we were going to add in post, which I designed. And I remember holding up on the iPad and we were on location and he could look at how to shoot it live. That was a decade ago. Mm -hmm. And that was just an art department tool. It wasn't anything new or clever. So don't be scared of virtual because it's just a re-implementation of all the techniques and tools you use every day. So That's so amazing. Um, 
I can hear you. I can listen to this all day long. <laughs> we have- Sadly, we've got like a minute left or something. We've got like a minute that. left. You took us to the very end. <laughs> well, I hope everybody has really enjoyed this. Thank and- you, everybody, for coming. And like, you know, get in touch and follow up with Blair. And I'm, you know, I'm open to answer questions. And, um, and also, if there's any information that anybody wants about the BFDG, including how to become a member, you can find all that information at BritishFilmDesigners.com. You can find us on, on uh, Instagram as well. And I didn't mention earlier, but you won Best Film. We and, did. Uh, we did. We won some things. and you won know, some things and did some stuff. And I, you know, I centered my identity in my speech. So it's just like, you know, trans whites now get Such a go. great moment. <laughs> I loved that moment. I live for that moment. I'm that, I love that for um, you. But it's, you know, the, I think there's a democratization that comes out of this in terms of it lets, it, it, uh, virtual lets art department grab a piece of the ground from post-production in a way that it never could. And I would, I would encourage people to become across it so they don't lose ground again and stuff. You know, the last thing you want is someone else deciding what's on the wall on your set. And you heard it here first. So thanks everybody. Thanks for coming. And uh, it's great to have the have the wonderful Jamie Lapsley here. And we're gonna have more of these design forums in the future. So hope everybody has a fantastic night. <laughs> um, thanks all. Thank you.